Thank you very much, uh, Guillaume. It's a, a great pleasure to be here uh, at IAS. Uh, I had a big chance to, to discuss a lot with Tom uh, during the whole COVID time, so it's very nice to be here for him. Um, so today I want to tell you about uh, a joint, two joint works, uh, one with uh, Avelio Sepulveda and uh, one with uh, David de Rodo. Avelio is from the Universidad de Chile and uh, David de Rodo from the University uh, uh, de Lille. And uh, what I should emphasize is that uh, I will use very soft tools. So maybe it's not appropriate at IES, I don't know, but very soft tools. Um, to prove some uh, maybe somewhat surprising results about the Coulomb gas in dimension D. Um, and the method will be uh, mostly elementary, except maybe the last. The last and I want to start with a, with a guiding motivation, uh, which is not about a, a gas of particles in, uh, in the lattice, but a gas of particles in RD. And I, give, uh, I want to give three examples uh, here of uh, Gibbs point processes. The talk will not be on this, so I will be a bit fast. The first one would be the, the easiest of all, which is the Poisson point process of RD, which you know uh, very well. A second example would be the, the so-called Genie or beta ensemble in dimension, uh, for example, two. You could define also this in dimension one and so on. And here uh, you want to uh, assign to a cloud of points in R2, the following probability, which is repulsive. So points don't want to be too close. It's uh, proportional to the product of the distances to the power beta. I have some uh, quotation marks here because if you want to do it properly on the, on the full uh, R2 plane, you need to take some kind of infinite volume limit here and it's not always a trivial to do so. But it turns out you can do this. And then you can look at this uh, translation invariant point uh, process in the plane and ask questions about the fluctuation of this. And uh, the type of question that uh, people have uh, been looking at, and I think it goes back to uh, uh, Joel Lebovitz in the early uh, 80s, if I'm not mistaken, is to understand uh, what are the fluctuations? How many particles do you have in a large box? Uh, how does this fluctuate as a function of the radius of the box? And there are even uh, more uh, counterintuitive questions of the following type. So the first type of question would be called uh, hyper uniformity. Hyper uniformity. So this means that the definition of this is that the variance of the number of points, say, in a ball of radius r, it's hyper uniform if this is little low of the volume of the ball. So if you take a Poisson prone process in Rd, you take a ball of radius r, by definition, the variance of the points in that ball will be lambda times the volume of the ball. So it's not hyper uniform. And what people realize is that for those systems, but to actually prove it rigorously, this is something very challenging, except in a few cases where there is exact integrability. Those systems are hyper uniform, they're more rigid, and they even satisfy, but this is usually not known, what's called the surface law, which means the variance of, of the number of points in the ball behaves like the surface of the ball and not the volume. And this has been shown in many cases, but usually assuming a big uh, assumption on the two-point correlation function. So this is the question one type of things that they look, and there is a question two, uh, which is called rigidity, and which is something quite counterintuitive if you've never heard about it. At least to me, it was a, a bit of a shock. So it is known, for example, uh, when beta is equal to two, which is a point process in the full plane, which arises as the local limit of the eigenvalues of random matrices. And this is very uh, integrable, it's a determinantal point process. It's known that if you sample this point process in the whole plane, and you take any, any set A in R2, 
If I sample this point, this determinable point process, I pick A and then I remove all those points. And I give you the information in the complement of A. You'll be able to tell me, if you have very good eyes, but you'll be able to tell me for sure what is exactly the number of points that I erased. So this number of points is known to be measurable with respect to the, uh, to the points outside of the, of the set A. The location of those, this is more difficult, but the number is measurable function, and this is called a rigidity. So I think in this case, this is proof of beta equals two, maybe one and four, which also have some integrability. I'm less sure here. Um, but in general, I think it's uh, uh, not known in the two dimensional case, and it has been proved recently uh, in 2018 uh, by uh, David De Rodre and uh, I think Milan Marida, uh, Thomas Leblay, and uh, Hardy uh, that it's rigid in dimension one. In dimension three, uh, I think uh, uh, all those questions are even more challenging, even to define uh, the LR equations and things like that for the infinite volume uh, Coulomb gas in R3 is very challenging. And the point of today, Stoke, is to address all those questions <laughs> for a Coulomb gas uh, on the d-dimensional lattice, but it's, it's a rather a two component meaning there will be plus charges and minus charges, and maybe I should even say a Z component. But uh, I will remark on the fact that we can also make the, just the two component case. So here the definition goes as follows. So I will make the definition in a finite uh, box in ZD, in ZD. And then I will tell you uh, how to take the infinite volume limit, but I will not take much time uh, on this question, as it's always the case in most statistical physics talks. So take a finite box lambda in a ZD, and uh, the probability measure will be a probability measure on the configuration of charges that could assign two positive charge here, uh, minus charge here, any uh, integer value charge at any vertex of this uh, domain. And the probability for each of these configuration uh, of charges will be proportional. So there will be a partition function that I will not write here. It will be proportional to exponential minus beta over two times this uh, energy here, this Coulomb energy between uh, Q and itself. So if, if, if you're less familiar with this notation, it's equivalent to summing over all charges i and j, q i, q j times the green function between i and j. And this includes the self, uh, the self uh, interaction energy between i and i. So here you may ask uh, me uh, quickly, uh, I'm sure Ron is already uh, second. Uh, the green function <laughs> needs to prescribe boundary conditions. So here the boundary condition on, on the boundary of lambda can either be free or Dirichlet. And this will influence which uh, green function I will take here. So for example, if I take Dirichlet condition, one way to properly define this is to only stick to a configuration of charges that are neutral. And if I, uh, this is if I take free, and if I take Dirichlet boundary condition, I can take any configuration of charge. There is no neutrality condition. And the first claim I want to make is that at least in dimension D equals two, uh, if you take the infinite volume limit of this system, the first thing is that it exists, it does stabilize as lambda goes to infinity. And also you get the same measure for the free and for the Dirichlet boundary condition. And the reason for that, which we will a bit see later, is that the Villain model in dimension two, uh, in the infinite volume limit, it doesn't remember what are the boundary conditions. So uh, infinite volume limit exists, and in some sense, at least for those boundary for those two boundary condition is unique. In d greater or equal to two uh, to three, the limit also exists, but I'm a bit less sure that uh, uniqueness is uh, straightforward. Uniqueness among these two boundary among these two boundary conditions. I think it's just unique, but I'm a bit less uh, 
I mean, you would need to say that the lattice gauge theory that has to do with this uh, doesn't see the boundary condition at infinity, and I don't want to say something wrong with the video going. So at least uh, infinite volume limits exists, but I don't want to, to say more about the uniqueness. So in any case, in whatever dimension, you can look at the system of charges in the wall uh, ZD, and you can ask <coughs> question uh, of the type of the one that I, that I said here. So for example, you can do D equals two, you can fix beta positive, you can sample a configuration of charges in the whole Z2, which would be translation invariant. And what you can do is you can take a large ball of radius R, and you can ask yourself, what is the total charge inside this ball of radius R? So you can ask, what is the variance, depending on beta, of the sum over X in the ball of radius R? of the charges, you sum all the charges on all the points X in this ball. Okay, so uh, to start answering this question and discussing what could be the behavior of this, uh, I will make a link with the Villain model, which is a dual in some sense to this uh, uh, configuration of charges and which will motivate also why it's interesting to understand the total charge inside the ball. So let me, which is a, a compact, uh, compact valued uh, spin system on ZD. So here the state space is uh, you assign angles in a, in a zero to pi on each vertex of your uh, box in ZD, doesn't need to be two dimensional. And the probability measure on theta x on, a, on this set of angles will be proportional to this uh, interaction. So you make the product over all uh, <coughs> nearest neighbor uh, sites, and you have this uh, kind of uh, Gibbs weight, uh, which looks a little bit, if beta is large, uh, exponential. Uh, I mean, it's not the same, it is proportional almost to exponential beta times cosine theta i minus theta j. If you do a Taylor expansion of this, you will basically have this plus much smaller terms plus a constant. So this is very close to the XY model, but a little bit different. And it's more integrable uh, from the point of view of the Coulomb gas than the XY model, which I will justify in a minute. So maybe let me very quickly tell you the link with the Coulomb gas. So maybe a uh, important comment is when beta is very large, uh, the system tends to look like that. Speeds want to have to share almost the same angle. But we are in the presence of a continuous uh, symmetry and in dimension two, it's known since Mermin Wagner that there is no longer range order. Eventually the angle will uh, decorrelate. And I will mention later, uh, important results about the, the correlation function. So what is the link between V1 and Q? And in fact, this link, I will not have time to spend too much time, but it's, I will explain it in dimension two. And if I have time, I will make a picture in dimension three. And, but the link works in any dimension D uh, that you wish. It's just that the, the, the link uh, requires you to work on the, on the um, uh, sort of one form of your graph. Okay, I, will, I will make this more precise later. So the link uh, is known for a very long time. It's known that the partition function of the, of the Villain model at inverse temperature beta it decouples into a partition function of a GFF at same inverse uh, temperature beta times um, uh, the partition function of a Coulomb gas. So it suggests that the Villain model can be written as a GFF component plus an independent uh, Objects arising from a Coulomb gas. 
So I will just give you a flavor of this equality. I will not prove it, but I will give you a short flavor of what are the tools to understand this. And for this, I will start with the expression of the partition function of the genome and try to see where this and this may come from. So this partition function, by definition, this is an integral over all the angle at each of the vertex of your graph of the product over the neighboring sides of this interaction that we defined between the spin theta i and the spin theta j. Sum over integers valued m is e of exponential minus beta over two theta i minus theta j plus two pi m square. And now I will do something we always do in statistical physics. I will exchange uh, product and sums, and I will write it as sum over a field of integers assigned to the edges of the graph. Uh, so MEE -E in the edges of lambda of integral over the angle exponential minus beta over two, theta i minus theta j, plus two pi, and at that, oh, sorry, there is a product of the edges, and at that edge i neighboring j, I put the integers that are fixed in this sum over here. Okay, so the partition function is just this. Let me go to to the blackboard. I'm not used to have so many blackboards. So if I if I look at this sum, I will uh, divide it into two things, and that's where you will see that I will only make a tenth of the proof. I will write this sum into two sum. The first one will be the sum over the field of integers on the edges, which are exact, which are exact one forms. So that means Me can be written as the D of Psi, where Psi is a, is a zero form, is a field of integers on the vertices of the graph. So now I want this partition function here, integrating over theta i of product over i neighbor j exponential minus beta over two, theta i minus theta j, plus two pi m of i j, I will write in a minute what it is. And I have the second thing, which I will not say much about, you will just believe me. I will sum over all the fields of integer e, which are non-exact. They do not arise from the differential of the zero form. And by point carré, it means the dm, the differential of this one form, will not be zero. If m was a d phi, you would have d squared phi would give you zero. So non-exact means dm is a q, which is non-trivial. Here, I will not make the computation, but if I would go further, this would exactly be the Coulomb charge. So let's see what is the contribution from the from no charges in the system to check that it's indeed the GFF and to at least make this part a bit uh, rigorous. So if a field of integer on the edges is exact, I can replace M on the edge I and J by Psi I minus Psi J. That's the meaning of being exact. So this is not, oh, I forgot to square here. So now I am summing over all integer valued at each side uh, i in lambda, and I am integrating over the angle between zero and two pi. So if you wish, I have my graph, and at each side i in my graph, I am summing over all possible integer values here. So maybe it's two pi times an integer, and I'm also integrating over all these real values here. So if I had the two integrals, I'm, I'm covering exactly the real line. And this sum of those integrals is nothing but, because of the easy change of variable, 
R to the long R, it's pro product over the edges, exponential minus beta over two, phi of i minus phi of j, where phi of i is this angle between zero to pi and two pi times an integer squared. And this is the partition function of the beta g. Okay, so in this decoupling, there is a GFF times something which codes what are the defects to this uh, uh, one forms of integer uh, along the edges. And there is a nice way to picture what is uh, going on. So this is something we did with Avelio, but it's, it's based on many things that happened before in the literature. And uh, what we wanted to, to use uh, as a technique in some of the proofs in the earlier work is that uh, there is a, a local sampling meta algorithm to sample the cooling gas, local sampling algorithm for the cooling gas. Which in principle is a little bit surprising because if you look at the Hamiltonian of the Coulomb gas, this is a long range Hamiltonian. So if you would want to do a Glauber dynamics, you would, you would at rate one at each point i in lambda, you would want to change the integer there. And for this, you would need to look at all the other charges, compute the change of energy here and make a, make a Glauber dynamics. This is very non-local. So a local way to do it is to proceed in two steps, a little bit like a, like a, if you would want to do sample an FK percolation from an easing, which is a bit of a strange idea because FK is faster than easing. But here you would first sample a VNR model, theta x, x in lambda. And once this has been sampled, quenched in theta, you, you sample a random one form M, which follows a little bit to this root here. So you sample, m of e given theta x. And I will not go into details here, but those are uh, independent integer valued Gaussian that are a bit shifty. But they're independent conditionally on theta x. So it's a field of independent random variables given theta x. And the third step is now that you have this. You say integer valued Gaussian. So they, they are independent, but each one has a integer. Uh, yes. Distribution. Yes. So it's something like that. You have the Gaussian, uh -huh. and then um, then you shift it by something like theta i minus theta j. So shift it Gaussian, and then you take the integer. Integer shift it Gaussian yes. independently for each one. Yes. <laughs> and now that you have this, you find the Q equals d of m. And this has exactly the law of a Coulomb gas. Okay. So a different way to picture it, which is very reminiscent of a very deep work of Titus Lupu, is to understand it in the following geometric sense: that you have your graph. You first sample the Villa model, as I said. But a way to picture those integer valued uh, variables is to do the following. Now, given those angles, you run a Brownian bridge along the circle from this angle to this angle. So I don't know how to picture it, but you have some bridge that connects those two things, a bridge that connects those two things, and so on. What it gives you is a cable graph XY model. And then on each face of the graph, you just look at what is the monodromy around the face. And what you can check is that those monodromies, this collection of all those monodromies, not only is a Coulomb gas, but this Coulomb gas is a kind of independent of a GFF, which was even. Okay, so. This ME would be the winding on every edge of the rounding motion of the circle. Yeah, so the ME is a little bit artificial. You need to define uh, how many times you cross two pi or something. 
But what is not artificial is the winding number. So all this to say, if that was not uh, clear, it's not too important for the rest of the talk. But the point here is that the Coulomb gas is something which represents, in a very precise sense, the uh, defects, the monodromies in the uh, Villain model. So if you take a Villain model in dimension two, <coughs> the Coulomb gas, if you have a plus two here, means that the the system has a four pi monodromy here. If it's minus one here, it has a two pi um, monodromy in the other direction, and so on. So you see a field of defects in the plane. And, uh, and now we want to take a big ball and to ask ourselves what is the cumulative uh, number of monodromies in this? Okay, so. At high temperature, I want to emphasize that it's going to be easy to prove uh, what's going on because the variance of the sum over x in Br of Qx, this is going to be sum over x and y of the two point coalition function of the charge at x and the charge at y. And here, it's not very hard to see that if you're deep into the bulk, by neutrality, so neutrality implies that sum over x, q0, qx is zero. The thing which is not completely obvious is that this sum is, uh, is uh, summable. But if you are at high temperature, the Villa model is something that decorrelates exponentially fast. And so very, this gives a very easy proof of the by screening. So at high temperature, at least, at low temperature, it's known to be wrong. At high temperature, it's very easy to show using those kind of uh, uh, couplings that uh, the charge at X is exponentially uncorrelated with the charge at Y. So this sum um, converges, and you can show by neutrality that it gives zero. And therefore, when you look at the variant, most of the term in the bulk, they don't give any contribution. It's only the point x and y that, that are at the wrong value. And those, when you make the sum, you, you miss something just because of the boundary. So it's only, in some sense, those interactions that are at remain. And you can show that this is less and a constant times the boundary of the ball of radius r. When you say neutrality, you mean some kind of local neutrality? It's not what you said earlier, that with free boundary condition, you impose a global neutrality. Yes, yeah, so here, indeed, you need to work a little bit because I'm on the full plane. Uh -huh. So what you can say is that the full plane is also the limit of the torus. Uh -huh. And there you have neutrality. And so you need to have this on the torus. And by exponential decay, the limit uh, as the torus goes to infinity gives the same as that. So you're saying this sum is really infinite sum, but the terms which are far away, large x, they hardly contribute to it. Yes. So even locally, it's almost zero. Yes, exactly. And so that's a soft way to get that there is a surface low at high temperature. And now the question is, what, what do you see at low temperature? And maybe now I need to say an important result about the, the Villain model. So the v, let me say it very quickly because half of the room is very expert here. So what is known, what was predicted by uh, Postolitz, Taules, and Berezinski in the 70s, is that as the temperature T grows, there is a critical VKT uh, uh, critical temperature, which is such that here there is an exponential decay of correlation. And here there is power low decay of correlation. And this was identified by uh, these uh, physicists in the 70s. It was rigorously proved by, uh, by uh, Tom and Jörg in the 80s. There are, uh, um, there are uh, recent uh, proofs uh, that are. A more geometric in flavor uh, by, um, by uh, Michael, 
Ron, Matam et uh, Jacob, le Shapiro, et uh, aussi par uh, Diederik van den Goldborg et uh, Martin Lies. Et Pete Lammers just uh, uh, came up with a, a, a nice equivalence here. Uh, so it's a fascinating uh, phase transition, a topological phase transition. And Kostolitz and Tarles, at the end of the 70s, uh, building on their initial intuition, they say that uh, there is this vortex unbinding uh, mechanism. So here, the, the Coulomb gas is, is, is supposed to be a plasma, so in the sense that plus and minus is charged don't see each other too much. But when you cross this transition, you're supposed to have plus and minuses that come in pair. Okay, so, so in some sense, what, what they, I think what they predicted was that there should be a phase transition for those, uh, for those uh, uh, fluctuations of the Coulomb gas. And they were hoping that there would be a difference that would spot this pairing mechanism at low temperature versus high temperature. And so the theorem that we show, so in some sense, I guess they were hoping that at high temperature, it would look like Poisson or something like this. And the argument I just showed by exponential decay rules this out. So the theorem that we can show, the first theorem, So CRM1, uh, for every dimension D greater than one, dimension one is a bit easy here. For any dimension D, uh, there is surface low at any positive temperature. So it means for Every D and every beta positive, there exists a constant which depends on beta and D, such that the variance of the total charge in the set A of Qx will be uh, bonded from uh, above by C times the bond area. And I think just by itself, uh, this has a, a, a sort of a nice implication here. If you want to do the same argument at low temperature Coulomb gas, what it suggests is that uh, it's less clear that this sum is still convergent, but in some sense, in order to have the surface low, it needs to be the case. So what it morally implies, we don't have the correlation inequality to fully uh, do this yet, but what it morally implies is that the two-point function of the Coulomb gas at very low temperature cannot decay in a polynomial way with a small exponent. And if you think of the Villain model or the XY model, the two-point correlation function uh, exponents, it's something like one over beta. And you might expect, I sort of naively expected, it would be the same for the two points correlation function of the Coulomb gas. This says that it cannot be, otherwise you would not have the surface. So it suggests, I don't know, maybe- it be like some kind of constellation, these correlations are always positive. Uh, but even if it's uh, positive, if, if the exponent is too low, It would not be integrable over the surface, and you would see something which would be bigger than the surface. What I'm saying is maybe they're negative sometimes, these correlations, and oh, they, would, they decay uh, slowly, they cancel each other in such a way to give you the surface effect. Yes, exactly. So this is those type of correlations that we don't have. So if Q0, Qx doesn't have the same sign as Q0, Qx plus one, then what I'm saying is not correct. And you don't know for sure whether it's this or that. Yes, but I would be surprised that it oscillates. So is this a something that uh, Kassel and Thales not stated was not true? <laughs> yes, so I've seen it in uh, papers by uh, Dar, and uh, so they, they predicted not when they did the BKT in the early 70s, but at the end of the 70s, yeah. that something different should happen uh, once you cross the vortex binding on binding. It is still possible that something different happens, no? Yeah, so it, it's possible, for example, that the, if you rescale this by the 
by the surface, you will see a constant which will depend on the temperature. And it could be that this constant has a, some non analyticity at the I mean, You have a lower bound for this bar? In oh, yeah, yes. Uh, there is also a lower bound in this. So it's really surface low always. And the lower bound is easy to see. The lower bound, you can do the following you can come here and you can play with the Villa model, for example, and, and just artificially put. Uh, with finite energy plus uh, plus minus charge there. So the lower bound of the surface is easy, the upper bound is your friend. So the way to prove theorem one, so I, I emphasize that those are soft tools, so it's going to be a, a very soft proof. The finite energy is clear because you have a Green's function interaction, so maybe- No, 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 the finite energy is far from being clear on the Coulomb gas. This is very difficult, but the finite energy is very easy on the Villain side. So you do it, uh, you condition on much of the Villain side, but not all? Or... Yeah, so I sample the, the Coulomb. Okay. Given the Coulomb, I go back in this uh, algorithm to the Villain. So they're coupled together. And the Villain, I can just rotate a little bit an angle there with the finite is, uh, In any dimension, <laughs> so the sampling algorithm you explained to us is only two dimensional, but you have well, it, it works in any dimension. I did not explain, but it works in any dimension. Exactly as written. Yes, so, okay, I can tell you how it works. So let me do it the three-dimensional case because I will need it at the end of the talk. So the algorithm, so this was in a previous work with uh, Avelio in D equals three. It works as follows. So I have my three-dimensional lattice. And I... By duality, I want to assign a charge to each of the cube in this three-dimensional lattice. And the idea here is to define a Villain model on the edges, which is called the lattice gauge theory with Villain interaction. So I will have a theta E for each E in the edges of this three-dimensional box. So they sort of want to align together, but it's a little bit more of a mess. And now uh, the algorithm samples theta e according to this lattice gauge theory. The second step is that it will sample uh, independent given the theta e uh, integer variables on all of the 2D plaquettes of the D3. So those are, uh, um, uh, those are uh, as before, uh, discrete Gaussians which are shifted by the differentiation of the angles along the plaquettes. I think go too much in the detail. So given angles on the edges, I sample integers on the faces in a local way. And then I take the differential of these two forms to get a number on each of the faces. And this has exactly the law of the Coulomb gas in this way. So there is a local algorithm despite this long range interaction for the Coulomb gas in this way. There is no longer a Brownian motion on the edges. Now it's something else. Right, yeah. So in fact, there is, but it's a bit more of a mess. There is a kind of Brownian motion along the packets. Okay. But, um, yeah. Okay, so, so let me uh, try to emphasize the proof of theorem one because I have other results I want to, to give um, after. So the proof is uh, very soft. <coughs> and uses a lemma, which is something that there are uh, places in the literature with a similar lemma, but it's the way to use it, which is a bit different. So the lemma is as follows. It says that for any F from the vertices of your box into the complex number, the Laplace transform of E to the F to the Q against F. So I have my Coulomb gas at inverse temperature beta, sampled according to the Coulomb gas on ZD that I introduced before. And I look at its effect on a, against a test function F. So I take a test function F on my lambda box in, this, in ZD. And I want to understand the Laplace transform of this, the moment generating function of this. And what the lemma says is that there is an identity which tells you that this is exactly 
the same as doing the Laplace transform of Laplacian of the GFF against the test function f. So of course the identity cannot be just this because uh, I mean this is an integer valued values. Uh, <coughs> this is the Gaussian field, and the correction and I view it as a correction is going to be here. So it's going to be one over beta. This is the temperature inversion, which is classical in this business. When you go from, uh, <coughs> from the charges or from the villain to the dual model of eight interfaces. And this is a model, which is the integer value GF. And the correction is exponential I. I think there is a one over beta, but this one is not very important. Laplace of the integer value GF psi against the test function f. Okay, so this lemma, I will not, uh, I wanted to prove, but I will not have time. So it's just basically a Poisson summation formula. Uh, it's also reminiscent of the sine Gordon uh, transformation. And in fact, such kind of formulas that give uh, Laplace transform of Coulomb in terms of Fourier transform of integer value GFF. But you can find such formulas in the papers of Frelich and Spencer already in the 80s. It's rather, I think, the paper on the Coulomb gas rather than the BKT. But those are sort of classical, maybe not written exactly this way, but they're, they're, they are not hard to prove. And once you face this formula, it implies something which uh, I think is very interesting. Well, it, it will immediately imply this here. So let me say why the lemma implies theorem one. And I will imply two other results with this lemma. So if you look at that, you can, uh, for example, uh, uh, put a little parameter here, make a Taylor expansion with respect to this parameter here. And what it implies is that the variance of Q against F will be exactly the variance of the Laplace of the GFF against F minus, thanks to this, minus the variance of the Laplace of an integer value phi against F. So what it implies that is that for every beta, in particular, the variance of Q against F for the beta Coulomb gas is always less than the variance of a Laplace of a GFF against F. And this you can compute. This is a constant times f minus Laplace of f, which is the Dirichlet energy of f. <coughs> so if in particular f is the indicator function of the set A, the variance of the total charge inside the set A, just by this uh, easy consideration, the variance of sum over x in A of Q of X will be less than the Dirichlet energy squared of the indicator function of the set A. And the Dirichlet energy is the integral of the gradient over A. You only feel the Bondi terms. So this is a, a so just the Bondi of A. Okay, so it's a very short proof, but it sort of shows, it implies that a, you cannot spot the BKT phase transition by considering how many charges do you have inside the ball. And let me say the second theorem that it implies before I move to the second part of the talk uh, about rigidity. So this lemma implies a second result that we obtained with uh, Avelio. So lemma implies theorem two, and theorem two is uh, the following. 
So I will take uh, now lambda a sub a sub domain of uh, R D, smooth domain of R D, and in this smooth domain, uh, I will look at the, the lattice, the small mesh eta times z3. And I will look at the Coulomb gas on this small mesh eta z3. And what I claim is that if I renormalize things properly, if it's eta one minus d over two, if I do this times uh, Laplacian inverse of q, it's a q eta on this lattice. So I sample the Coulomb gas on this eta mesh lattice. I look at the electric potential which is induced by this Coulomb gas, and I renormalize, renormalize it the right way uh, with this. The theorem says that this converges to uh, GFF. With with an effective temperature Tf of T. <coughs> so there is a kind of a invariance principle for the electric potential induced by a Coulomb gas. And the theorem works for every dimension d greater or equals to two and for every T. And for this, I need to prescribe a little bit what I mean. And I will make just a drawing. So let me start with the case dimension d greater or equal to three. So if d is three, the profile of the effective temperature is like that. As a function of the temperature of the Coulomb gas, the effective temperature is just linear. And we can prove it rigorously when T is large enough. And this is very soft. This is basically using basically lemma one and trying to understand what is the Fourier transform of this electric potential. And here, this is much more difficult. This is not us, but using a deep work and plugging it into this lemma. If you use Gupfert Mac, I think 82 or 83, I'm not sure. It morally implies that the effective temperature is also linear in T. Only morally implies because there is something a little bit subtle with the boundary conditions. But modulo that, you get also this. And in between, I think then Gini inequality would allow you to close the gap. Um, but in any case, there is a little bit of an issue with boundary conditions. In dimension two, the picture is, I think, very beautiful. And the effective temperature here is like that. When the temperature is large, what we prove using this lemma is that we get a GFF which is whose temperature is linear in T. There is no effect of the vortices somehow. And I think it, it's not difficult, but it was not known before that there is such an invariant principle. And, and then, when t is small, I have a uh, lot of things to say here. Uh, Froelich and Spencer, what they had shown in the 80s in a, this very deep work is that, um, no, sorry, so they, they were here. So they had shown that uh, that that the Coulomb gas does not fluctuate too much. So they had an upper bound on the fluctuation of the Coulomb gas. Uh, three years ago, two years ago, with Avelio uh, Sepulveda, we, we had uh, the other side of the story, which says that uh, the Coulomb gas does fluctuate as much as a normal GFF would do. Uh, and we had a, a, a lower bound on those fluctuations of the GFF here. And uh, last year, there was a very deep work by uh, Roland Borchit, uh, Yewen Park, and Pierre Francois Rodriguez. And what they showed is uh, that the integer value GFF, which is in this lemma one that I erased, this has an invariance principle towards the continuum GFF. 
So using this lemma and for proof, which is served of an inverse principle, as a corollary of the RCRM, we get GFF convergence for low enough temperature T, which is here. Because those two curves do, wouldn't give an inverse principle, it would just give bond from here. So we have G GFF fluctuation rigorously at low temperature and high temperature, and in between, they should sort of match at the BKT condition. Okay, so I think even in, in their very deep work, it was not so clear that uh, there is a lower bound here uh, of the effective temperature. And on this curve, maybe this is a uh, worse to say, on this curve, at any temperature T, there is this, which is the fluctuation of the electric, uh, electric field. And there is also this, which remains. And the two things add up to the, sorry, add up to give the GFS. This, by the lemma one, the lemma here, is exactly the fluctuation of the integer value GFF at inverse temperature. The distance to the linear, to the line. Yes. So the sum of the two by this lemma one gives you the GFF. So you can see that here, the integer value GFF is localized. And at the moment it delocalizes, you have to split the fluctuation into the Coulomb and the integer value. OK, so in the, in the remaining of the talk, I want to tell you about rigidity. So theorem three. Before I state it, now I define, I look at, it will be in dimension two, the theorem three. I want to look at the gas of vortices in dimension two. So I look at all these monodromies of the Villain model in dimension two. And we ask ourselves with uh, David de Rune, uh, is this gas of charges rigid in the sense of, uh, of Lebovitz and uh, all the works that have appeared since then? So in other words, you sample all the, all the vortices, you take a set, you remove what is inside, and you want to know if you can recover the total charge in that set, given the vortices that you see outside. And we, we thought, okay, maybe, the, maybe this uh, hyper-uniformity of surface law doesn't see BKT condition. Maybe this criterion of rigidity will. That as soon as you go into the plasma phase, maybe you, you, you lose the rigidity. Well, the theorem says that for every T, for every beta, the Coulomb gas On Z2 is rigid, is charge rigid. So also this doesn't see the BKT. And the proof, the proof of this, I will try to make it very short. The ID goes back to, the proof will be very short. The ID goes back to a, a very nice paper by a, Gauche in Paris in 2017. And they have in this paper a criterion to detect rigidity of a point process. And what they show is that if, if this is the box A or ball of radius R or whatever set that you are interested in, and you sample your cooling gas in the whole plane and you forget what is inside. To prove that you can recover the total charges here, what they say is that you, it's sufficient to find a function f, which is one inside a, and uh, does whatever you want outside, but you want to minimize the display energy of this. So if you can, if you can do that, and that proof is a very short given this, then you can show that this is rigid. So maybe in this setting, I can convince you why this works. So let me take, let me take the ball of radius R for the L infinity norm, say, in Z2. And let me pick the function F, which will be one here, and which will slowly decay as in the Mermit-Wagner to zero at a much larger radius. What lemma says, the lemma 
on both sides, it implies that the variance of F against the configuration of charges in the whole plane Z2, this is less than the constant times the Dirichlet energy of F. In particular, by Mermin Wagner, I can make this Dirichlet energy as small as I want, less than epsilon. Uh, this would be some big radius uh, L. You know. And this will go to zero logarithmic fast as L goes to infinity. So I can find the test function F, which is such that the variance of F tested against the charges will be extremely small. Why does it help me to prove rigidity? This is the idea of Gauche and Perez. I take, the, I take the, the, the charges in the whole Z2. I don't know what is there. This I have no idea. But what I can do is I can test the remaining charges Q against this F, which has a slope. It gives me a number. But I know that the variance is extremely small. So I know what is ex expectation. And I know that I need to be very close to the expectation. And anytime I add a particle here, it, it changes by one or by minus one. So since the variance is very small and I have access to what is this more complicated part of the, of the F against Q, I can recover exactly with high probability what is the exact number of charge inside the ball. So just small Dirichlet energy implies the implies rigidity, and since the lemma doesn't see the effect of the temperature, it implies rigidity <coughs> at all temperatures. How much time do I Maybe two minutes. Two minutes. So the last theorem I want to give, it's theorem four. And it's the case of dimension greater or equal to three. And here what we can show is that if uh, beta is small enough. <laughs> so in other words, at, at high enough temperature, uh, the Coulomb gas is not rigid. And let me give a two minutes proof. And this proof uses uh, this uh, algorithm that we uh, had found with Avelio. So if you take, for example, Z3, you want to show that the Coulomb gas the set of charges in dimension three is not rigid. So what do you want to do? You, you, take, a, you take a box here. You sample the whole uh, field of uh, charges. And what you would, you would want to say is that inside this box, you are able to add a new charge that was not there at the beginning in a way which is absolutely continuous. And the idea to do that is to use this sampling algorithm by saying that, well, let me just take the, the cube at zero. I don't even need the ball of radius R. If I take the cube at zero, and I want to add a charge there in an absolutely continuous way to disprove rigidity. So what I can do, I can first sample the, the, the Villain model on the edges, this kind of lattice gauge theory on the edges. So I sample a field of Villain angles on all the edges of this three. And then uh, I, have, uh, I know that I have laws that are uh, integer Gaussians on all these uh, faces. And what do I want to show? I want to show that I can find a path going from infinity, a path of a nearest neighbor cube like that. And what will I do with this path? I want to increment by one the faces along the path. So if I make plus one here and plus one here, when I will make the differentiation of the two form of the faces, it will have exactly the same monodromy inside. So if I can find a path going from infinity towards this box, but which will stop at this box, it will have no effect on the rest of the charges in the whole ZD, but here it will have a plus one on that side of the box and nothing elsewhere. So the, the discrete differential of these two forms will give me a plus one 
charge at that, at that box. So the only thing I need to be able to do is to add an infinite, a random infinite pass coming from infinity to stick a charge into this box. And it turns out, and I will finish on this, that this question was asked in the statistics literature. There is a paper, I think you don't have all the courses, but I think there is a Emmanuel Combes and Offer Zaituni, and I think two other authors. Well, they showed that in a high enough dimension, you can do this in an absolutely continuous way. You can change Gaussians by one in a way which is indistinguishable. So in our case, we just have to follow that proof. Those are not Gaussians, they're integer valued Gaussians, but it still works basically the same. And we can add a particle. And the funny thing is that the main ingredient in this proof is a, is a theorem by Benjamin Pimentel and Perez, which we used a lot recently with Atom. So the same strange measure on pass gives a lack of rigidity here and long range order for spin systems. And do you have a conjecture about rigidity for small beta? Ah, yes. Large beta? It's a good question. So, so I would think it's, it's, it will be a rigid at, uh, at low temperature. And here is the reason why, but it's not a proof. So if now the temperature is low, if beta is large, then this result by a condensed atony using those paths tell you that now shifting the Gaussian variable, and it also works for the discrete Gaussian, this becomes, a, you, can, you can see that you, that you cheated in the system. It's not absolutely good. It's not absolutely good. But the reason why it doesn't give us uh, rigidity for us is that we have two sources of randomness here, the angles in Villa and then the field of discrete Gaussian. The field of discrete Gaussian would see the trick, but you could also imagine that you could also act on all of the angles in a smoother way. And this is much harder to, to analyze. So I think at low temperature, there is not so much space to play with the angles and therefore it should be rigid. But there is no proof. Uh, to prove theorem two, do you use the result of Bauer Schmidt, et cetera? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so maybe I was not uh, clear enough here, but in theorem two, so this part here is easy. It only, it only uses basically this lemma plus the localization of the field plus a little bit of tightness of the fields that I'm looking at. This part here, so the tightness is not difficult. It's basically Ginebra and uh, this is not difficult. The fact that it's convergence to the GFF, the big input is the work by Boer, Schmidt, uh, Park, and uh, so it's, it's a corollary, if you wish. It's definitely not as deep, but one take all the substance of their work, or the GFF, and we said that it also gives a GFF fluctuation for the Coulomb part. So it analyzes a lot. So in the middle, it's still not clear. Hmm? So in, in, the, in between, it's still not in, you know, So in between, what we, what we have is a upper and lower bound of the fluctuation, tightness of the field. So there is some limiting distribution. Uh, exists, I mean, uniqueness of the limit is not clear. It could oscillate and do all kinds of things. But yes, here, besides those tightness, it's not clear. There's an interesting interplay between the concepts which are explained in the Villay model, in the language of the Villay model, and what physicists, uh, all time physicists, uh, uh, use to, disc to describe Coulomb systems. Uh, rigidity, in effect, corresponds to the fact that the electrostatic potential within the system diverges. Because after all, if you ask what's the change in the energy of removal mm -hmm. of part, part, it's exactly the electrostatic potential that has the charge. Mm -hmm. So rigidity is divergence of the electrostatic potential. The surface law, uh, essentially, by, by Coulomb law, the total charge within the surface is the flux integral of the electric field, mm -hmm. which is the gradient of the potential. So in a way, the uh, theorem, theorem two, I think, uh, correspond could be explained could be understood in terms of uh, uh, the statement that this electrostatic flux 
integral over a surface uh, has, a, has a finite second moment, which converges to, which translates into summability or integrability, at least condition for the electric field, electric field correlation. So it may be nice to translate this concept. Yes. And one more thing. <clears throat> These considerations apply also in one dimension where the, the discussion is even simpler and the phenomena are interesting because you do not have uniqueness of the Gibbs state for understanding. Yes, in dimension one, you have a, on, on the Jellion, you have a Philip Martin. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I think a message which is intuitive to explain is that if I'm not mistaken, for Coulomb systems, the electric field as a random variable makes sense in the infinite volume limit. And why is that so? Well, the Coulomb electrostatic energy is essentially integral of the square of the electric field mm -hmm. up to uh, you know, self energy. So these are very beautiful concepts, also useful. We, what I'm saying is that it may be nice to, to clarify better the relation between the Villain yes. representation and that of the electric field, the good of Electric field. Yes, I, I agree. Maybe two comments on the first one. I fully agree that uh, if one would have access to the two point correlation function, then the surface law would readily follow. Like just by uh, sort of the sum that I explained before. But as far as I know, uh, to, to, to have access to those two point correlation function is, is the difficult part somehow. We usually have the story to say that they. So, for example, me. I'm now even wondering that maybe there is no Debye screening for the Coulomb gas at low temperature. This is a, a theorem of you and Jörg. The same that if you add fractional charges, there is power of decay. But it could be the case that the two point function of the Coulomb gas, the QX, QY, it's not impossible that this is exponentially decaying. And so the different definition of the Debye screening may not match in this low temperature region. And uh, about the second uh, uh, nice comment that you made, I agree that the electric potential will be well defined and in the infinite volume limit, but in dimension two, uh, it, it will be a GFF, so it will be well defined up to a diverging additive constant. The Laplace and inverse Q in the infinite volume limit, uh, it's going to be GFF. So. But that's the potential, not the electric. The, the inverse Laplace and Q is the potential. Oh, the potential. That, uh, the whole point is that it does fluctuate away, yes. and that's why you have rigidity. Yes. So then it, Are you the derivative of that is uh, the measure by e to the plus or minus infinity. Yes, OK, now, now I see it. Any, any chance to get another uh, perspective on the Gupfert back result from your uh, technology? Maybe you can. I, I don't know the proof. Maybe you can give a nicer proof. Okay, so I think um, I think what we do here is a uh, is connecting deep things together. We make like nice quotes between those, but in none of these proofs, you see, there is never any renormalization group, or there is no hard analysis. It's more making the connections. So for example, we use this result by uh, Paul Schmidt, Park, and uh, Rodriguez to say, look, there is a nice invariance principle for the Coulomb gas, but we don't prove, uh, we don't go through the renormalization group, we just take the juice. In Gupfer and Mac, it's the same, we take the juice. But maybe in a different model, the result becomes easier. Yes, yeah, so we, 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 you're right. So with those new roads between the things, those new- uh, The inside something else could be said, I don't know. Just asking. No, it's a good, it's a, okay. So what you're saying is uh, at low temperature, the villa will be what it is, which is this complicated PKT phase, but if something no, can- no, it's 3D. Oh, it's 3D, yes. So this would be the lattice gauge theory at low temperature, but this one is also a little bit the focus of Gupfert and Mac. It kind of work by duality with the two. Yeah. Okay. So I adopt this. Okay. There would be any retroaction that would avoid the renormalization. And this must be a classical question, but anyway, uh, what's the mass of the uh, exponential decay of Q0, Qx uh, as a function of beta? Uh, no, so I think so. If I, if I look at Q0, Qx, so there will be certainly a mass at the large temperature, which will be related to the 
to the mass of the integer value GFF at inverse temperature. And uh, Pete Lamos just found, uh, just uh, uploaded a paper which says that this mass is uh, related to uh, twice the mass or one half, I forgot, the XY model. Okay, so here, this is the Venus, so it's slightly different. But now what I was saying earlier is that I don't completely exclude that this is going to be massive even at low temperature, even though there is no device screening. Yes, and what would be your conjecture for what this? Oh, I'm not even completely sure of this conjecture, so about the mass. And, and, but this would be, I think, I'm a bit less sure, but it would be a bit like looking at the two-point correlation function of the Laplacian of an integer valued field at x and at y, but in their high temperature region. If those were GFF, this, the correlation function of the Laplacian is zero. If the integer valued but high temperature GFF, it's not impossible to me that it's exponentially decaying, but I don't know if there are good experts in the room now. If this is exponentially decaying, it says that the Coulomb is remains exponentially decaying even in the BKT phase, even though the device screening by adding fractional charges does something completely different. So I think it would be interesting <laughs> to say in this case that the different notions of the by screening, they, they, don't, they don't match. That's a very dumb question. Um, when you about proof theorem one, you said something different to what I thought you were going to say. So I'm trying to figure out why what I thought you were going to say is stupid. Um, if these charges really are just part of the really is just the monodromy as you go around these experimenting bridges, then the sum of the monodromies is going to be the monodromy around the the, the burning bridges around the boundary of the shape, and it seems it seems intuitively reasonable that that should be have small variance because they're just sort of independent burning bridges. Is that sort of just has technical issues and it's the same proof model? No, I think it's a very good comment. Yes, indeed, there would be some kind of a of a Brownian bridge, except it's not quite a Brownian bridge, uh, and you would guess the variance is the sum of root. Except it's not uh, really a Brownian bridge because you have uh, all the so pinning it to each. Yes, like it could be forced to. Uh, right, right. You have some pathological angles that sort of yes. make it move. I see. If these were independent, it would be trivial. But if they were forced by the system to sort of go quicker, you would not completely rule out a bit. But I agree with you that. Okay. In, in dimension larger, I'm a bit less sure what it means. But, uh, it's Okay, but let's increase off again.